Well, I hope you're sitting back comfortably right now, working, because the subject of this tape is work. Specifically, work and the freelancer, and how we can make our work time most effective and also enjoy our time off. This will be, hopefully, a tape that we can all contribute a few thoughts to, and uh, maybe we'll get something out of it. I want to start with a story. Uh, a friend of mine who's an art director uh, says that, told me that when his kids were young and he was freelancing, his daughters were about 13, and uh, his daughter walked into the room where he was working with a friend of hers, and a friend said, does your dad work? She goes, no, he just sits there and draws all the time. Let's face it, guys. What we do is not conventional nine-to-five work where we have to commute to do it. At least it doesn't have to be. You know the kind of work that everybody else in the world does, the nine-to-fiver. Living the pure and a working that cat, drive a new car. What you think about that? Two weeks vacation, retirement plan. I gotta make a living. I'm a caterpillar man. That's what I am. That's what I am. Said if I ain't a living, so my name ain't Sam. I gotta make a living. I'm a caterpillar man. Well, 718, when the whistle blows, it means one thing, gotta go, go, go. Working at a welder on a welding line, I'm making them parts for the big P9. I'm a caterpillar man, that's what I am. Said if I ain't a lips and my name ain't Sam, I gotta make a living, I'm a caterpillar man. A good union, the 974, and they like my neighbor who lives next door. Finest man you ever can see, an old country boy from Tennessee. He's a caterpillar man, that's a what he am. Said if I didn't live, said my name ain't Sam. I gotta make a living, I'm a caterpillar man. Well, I got myself a little country band I do a little picking every time I can Friends, you can't beat a deal like that I'm a real swinging caterpillar cat That's what I am That's what I am Said if I didn't live, so my name ain't Sam I gotta make a living, I'm a caterpillar man When I draw my pay, I watch she heads out to Big K. Happiest woman you ever can see, shopping up and down University. I'm a caterpillar man, that's what I am. Said if I ain't a lips of my name ain't Sam, I gotta make a living, I'm a caterpillar man. That was Mr. Carl Trent singing Caterpillar Man. It comes from an album of songs, songs of labor and livelihood that's put out by the Library of Congress. And in the notes, in the liner, it says, This driving, up-tempo song about modern factory work is spiritual kin to many recent truck-driving songs and older traditional pieces which colorfully assert themes of independence and self-sufficiency on the job. Independence and self-sufficiency, that's something that not only the trucker and the caterpillar man, but also we have to have and work in home in our studios. That's one of the main themes that we got to address here is how do you stay motivated to work a good long day when you're sitting in your comfortable home and drawing pictures with a glass of juice next to you, not too far from the refrigerator and from interesting magazines. You know, a lot of people always ask, uh, any of us, you always hear the same question, you must be really self-disciplined 
to set your own schedule. And I suppose that's true. Um, but I often point out when people say that, that sometimes when the work is going good, you have, to, you have to discipline yourself not to work all the time. You've got to actually um, discipline yourself to have free time and to use your home as free time. Tom has pointed this out a number of times, too. Uh, Jeanette and I have observed that um, we often have to leave home in order to really, to really enjoy our vacation because the work tends to, um, tends to fill the time, the preoccupations of being around home. There's always a job sitting on the board, let's face it. And that means that while I'm home, if I'm not working on a job, it's time being lost. Now I want to I want to try to mend that, especially with a family coming, so that uh, without being too strictly regimented, I can enjoy both the the time, the work time, and the free time. But I, as as I'm sure everyone does, I suffer from procrastination, um, <clears throat> and it often takes me a while to get warmed up and to really get into the work. That's especially true of painting, and it's especially true when I'm starting a painting. Is this true with you, you guys who, who, who um, are painting also? Do you find that in the first two, three days of a painting, when you're kind of laying it in, that it's really hard to bust into the, into the uh, joy of painting? It's kind of a chore at first, establishing all the colors. It doesn't look so great. You can't jump into the picture plane and live in the picture because it looks like a mess. So what... What keeps you driving? What keeps you into the picture? I find I often get drowsy and want to sleep, especially if I'm getting up early in the morning during that time. And it's only by forcing myself into the picture that it starts. the picture starts to provide its own reward. And uh, that kind of kicks in. That mechanism of, of joy kicks in, and I can you know, plow through to finish the picture. Now, do you find that there are times in the creative process when you have to motivate yourself more? Uh, and are there times when you have to actually stop yourself from working so that you don't fill all your time with work? Now, Paul, you've said that you don't have to worry about that because life provides plenty of distractions, chores, and things that need doing, errands, so that um, th there's never a problem of of trying to allow time off work. But um, I'd, I'd int be interested in your thoughts on that. Uh, I also want to raise the question about the workaholic. What is a workaholic? Do you know workaholics? Are we workaholics? I'm, I, the picture I have in my mind is of someone who, who like doesn't go outdoors and who works from morning till night every day and has no real satisfaction in life outside of their work. Was that true of Rockwell, for example? I don't know. Kissinger? It sounds like some of the guys on the, um, like some of the guys who were in charge of briefing President Reagan. I, I read a, a biography of, uh, or a, a, an article about one of these guys who works as the, um, the head briefer for Reagan. And the kind of schedule this guy has is in, insane. It's like a 20-hour day. And from the very first moment he wakes, he's starting to assemble the information to feed the president. And he's, he's going through piles of material. And he has no life, no social life. He's not married. There's absolutely nothing in his life outside of work. Now, I think it's obvious that style of, of living can't really work for an artist. I mean, maybe for the short term, you can get a little more done if you work that many hours. Or on a deadline, we can, you know, we can crunch over our schedule and, and get, uh, pump out a lot of work. But I know after I've done something like that, I've got to recover for about two weeks <laughs> after I've done a bunch of all-nighters. I can't work after I've, I've done one of those binges. And also... You know, I guess you need to kind of look at a few sunsets and, and walk through a few rainstorms 
and make some kind of observations that you can tie into your work, whether or not you're sketching. You know, I think, I think that the brain needs time off. How can we make that time off as, as productive as possible? Uh, but back to the question of, of motivation and, and um, getting involved in our work and everything. I, I got one of these thesauruses of quotations, and I, I um, penciled a few quotes that spurred my thought, my thinking here. Max Beerbohm said, No fine work can be done without concentration and self-sacrifice and toil and doubt. Well, that's comforting. The idea that that the toil and the doubt, 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration, <laughs> But that the, the, the toil and the doubt, which can be so frustrating at times, are really a key part of, of really creative work. Also the point about concentration. Um, do you do your best work when you have music or books on tape playing? Or if there's someone else in the room you're talking to? Um... I find that when I'm painting, sometimes when I have music playing, I paint better than than I would otherwise. But the work environment's really important. Here's a quote by Finley Peter Dunn. He says, Work is work if you're paid to do it, and it's pleasure if you pay to be allowed to do it. Now, I think he swiped that from you-know-who, Mark Twain. Here's how Mark Twain put it. In Tom Sawyer. He had discovered a great law of human action without knowing it. Namely, that in order to make a man or a boy cover a thing, it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. If he had been a great and wise philosopher, like the writer of this book, he would now have comprehended that work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do, and that play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. And this would help him to understand why constructing artificial flowers or performing on a treadmill is work, while rolling ten pins or climbing Mont Blanc is only amusement. There are wealthy gentlemen in England who drive four-horse passenger coaches 20 or 30 miles on a daily line in the summer because the privilege costs them considerable money. But if they were offered wages for the service, that would turn it into work, and then they would resign. Well, ain't that the truth? Now, for me, I can say most of the time drawing and painting is a real joy, but sometimes it's a chore, and... Uh, I suppose that's true with any kind of freelance work for a writer or anything else. And, of course, when when I used to draw before even thinking about a career, you know, I would stay up late every night on a binge just enjoying the pure love of it. How do you keep that that sense of just pure joy in, in work and not let it become a chore or a habit or a rut uh, how do you keep it fresh? Here's some more quotes. Let's see. Okay, on the subject of the workaholic, Margaret Fuller said, Men, for the sake of getting a living, forget to live. I think Charles Hawthorne or Robert Onrey said something like, um, uh, make art your life, not your living. Emerson said, we put our love where we have put our labor. Um, Leonardo da Vinci said, thou, O oh God, dost sell us all good things at the price of labor. One, th one thought I used to encourage myself is that... Um, that every problem is sol solvable by effort. Uh, no matter how rough a passage looks to paint, 
just by sitting down and figuring it out, the problem can always be solved. It only seems more difficult when you're looking at the drawing table with your arms crossed. And that's true. I really think that's true. Oh, also, um, Paul and I have been exchanging... Um, exchanging these 3 by 5 cards, which have um, memorable quotes on them. And and uh, one that we like is by Longfellow, the latter of St. Augustine. The heights of great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in the night. I love that one. Uh, and then there's the definitions of genius. Uh, Rockwell said it's genius is... Um, an ability to take infinite pains. I like that quote too. Here's the classic quote on procrastination. Work expands to fill the time available for its completion. From Northcote Parkinson, Parkinson's Laws. Did you know that's what his name was? Northcote Parkinson? Here's what Ruskin has to say. It is only by labor that thought can be made healthy, and only by thought that labor can be made happy, and the two cannot be separated with impunity. Let me read that one again. It is only by labor that thought can be made healthy, and only by thought that labor can be made happy, and the two cannot be separated with impunity. I wonder what sort of thought he's talking about. Do you do better work, for example, if you read every night, you read the night before you work? I think I do. I also think I do better work when I take my morning walk and um, come home. Not only the exercise, but just the mental thing of being detached from the problem that needs solving. Um, I find that when Jeanette and I, because of the weather or something, we have to drive... I find I don't work as with as much vitality. Now here's one of the best quotes. This is by Albert Hubbard, 1927. He said, The best preparation for good work tomorrow is to do good work today. You build on the effort that you've achieved previously. Another thing I often think that encourages myself is to try to finish the day's work on a picture, wanting to do more, leave some passages un unfinished. You know, you want to put on the Tasty Boy stroke. Just wait at the end of the day and, w and don't put that Tasty Boy on and save that so the next day, when you look at that painting, you go, oh, I know what I was going to do. I was going to put in, put in this highlight here or just put in this stroke. And then the minute you jump into it and start into the picture, um, it starts to, you know, the, the um, enthusiasm and the joy of the work sort of, sort of kicks in. Well, anyway, um, I don't want to talk on and on because this is a fairly short tape, and I really want to hear what each of you has to say about um, what you find difficult and what uh, about the freelance lifestyle and what you find rewarding about it and any any tips quotes suggestions reminders that you use on yourself in order to keep up to schedule how do you schedule your day um how do you set it up so that you really f get joy out of your freelance work um so i'll send this tape out look forward to hearing your responses Well, Jim, this is James. I uh, I guess I'm the uh, I guess I'm the first one to respond. Um, I tell you, uh, Jim, you've hit upon so many really important things that that I could easily probably fill up this tape BSing, but I'll try to keep it to. Uh, it's really a great.
great subject, and I think uh, all of us uh, as freelancers can appreciate uh, a lot of the things that you've said because I, they, they have those same ideas you've put across are, this, are definitely the things that have rolled around in my head. Uh, freelancing is really uh, a pe peculiar thing because it it really does de uh, make one depend on one's own discipline uh, for a good portion of the uh, work time. And uh, I've often talked to people who, you know, they've, they've said, oh, I could never do freelance. I mean, or they've done freelance and then they went back to a full-time job because they just couldn't uh, handle it. Um, so those of us who do freelance, I think we are kind of special in that we can uh, keep the motivation going. And uh, I, uh, what you said in the beginning as far as uh, uh, it not being conventional and, and the way that some people, I think you quoted uh, your friend, uh, your, your friend who's an art director who, who, was, uh, uh, who had comments uh, uh, such as that, that he wasn't really working, I mean, yeah, of course. I I think all of us have probably got comments like that that we really don't work. We just uh, draw and paint, and in a way that's just playing. But uh, I don't know. At times it, it is. It does feel that way. Uh, but much of the time it is uh, drudgery. Um, I can remember back in the old days when I had to really work for a living or do manual labor back in Pittsburgh. Uh, I worked at my dad's uh, junkyard and it was a real good experience because it was another form of exhaustion, uh, just physical exhaustion uh, after working uh, 10 hours a day for a whole week, six, six days to the week. Uh, uh, there was satisfaction in, in that and that just a satisfaction of, of accomplishing something, knowing that you've physically exhausted yourself. And I think as a freelancer in doing uh, illustration and painting, uh, there's a different type of, of exhaustion. And it's, it's for me anyway, it's, it's more mental. And uh, I think that we all have our limits as far as how much we can actually do, uh, I'm always trying to uh, try. I'm always trying to make my uh, work time as as efficient as possible because I know I can become mentally drained uh, pretty quickly. Um, so if I don't get a good start in the morning, I, I could usually, you know, predict how my day will go uh, the rest of the day. And that's kind of what I, I contend myself with, uh, is getting off to a good start and uh, trying not to be interrupted and uh, uh, not taking too much, uh, too long of a breakfast uh, uh, period. And um, uh, you mentioned my big question to motivation is. In this is uh, and I'm probably repeating maybe what you you had said, Jim. Is during a picture, how much how much of one's time is dealt with really uh, pure discipline or pure motivation and the joy of painting? Um, I've often thought that for myself that the first three quarters of a painting I had to really push myself, really, you know, work hard and, and work hard at, at disciplining myself to keep on schedule, try to get, you know, a certain amount of, of work done every day. Um, and uh, maybe 25% of the uh, time was just pure motivation from, from inspiration and enthusiasm and the satisfaction of accomplishment and, uh, um, 
that usually comes toward the end of the picture. And I, I really, uh, I don't see it happen until I'm at least halfway through a picture. Uh, I know you mentioned how it, it possibly t takes one, two, or three days to get to get into a picture. Um, if it takes you, you know, five days or six or seven days to, you know, complete one. So I mean, that's that's you know maybe getting close to that to that figure. But um, I always envy people that that uh, were able to to work into the late hours of the evening and uh, maybe into the morning, just just from pure joy of painting. I I can never, uh, I like, you know, I certainly like painting, and, uh, uh, but I can never work, I can never do all-nighters. That's one thing I've, I've never have done, is work late. And uh, it seems like uh, my, uh, my natural motivation of uh, enjoyment and everything is, is really uh, goes down the drain as I get as it gets later and later. Um, but anyway, that that's getting a little off the uh, the questions. But um, uh, let's see here. Uh, a big part of the motivation, of course, is are the deadlines and, and when you get swamped with work. Right? You, that certainly that. That keeps me going. Um, uh, it's it's too bad that, because it could have a, a bad effect on on one's you know uh, on on a freelancer's uh, own work uh, when they do get free time because it it almost conditions one to think that there has to be a deadline. Um, for them to work, and uh, um, I've somewhat gotten into that into that uh, conditioning of, of of having a deadline to complete, you know, a piece, and they use that as motivation to get it to get it done. And that's probably a mistake, um, or it's it's really not a mistake, but just kind of an un unavoidable. Uh, characteristic of freelancing. Um, freelancing is a really a different, uh, whole different thing, uh, because uh, we gotta, you know, we gotta turn it on and turn it off, and we can't very easily go by, you know, an eight-hour day, eight-hour work day or a five-day-a-week work day. Uh, Quite often, uh, you know, we have to work through weekends and, and through the through the evening, and um, then we get to take our lunch breaks. Uh, but maybe uh, maybe uh, other people uh, have gotten it to that point where they can they can make it a eight hour workday with a lunch hour. And, uh, but I I tell you I I really uh, I can't very easily, you know, do that. Um, another thing that you mentioned, Jim, was uh, having the discipline to to not work, and um, I never had a problem with that because uh, uh, I've, I've uh, dealt so much with, you know, disciplining myself to work that maybe, uh, maybe some of some of the others have uh, devised ways of, of keeping to that easel, and uh, quite often I joke with people saying that I'm kind of changed of the others. Take care. Bye bye. Well, now we'll have to chip in and get for a whole new tape recorder. You know what I forgot to bring? Oh, this we're recording. We're recording now. Oh. Well, you know what I forgot to bring? Is I was going to bring my notebook, my idea notebook, because I was going to share some of my ideas with you and see if she thought. It also has my... Sounds book. like a perfect tape premise. It does. Uh, it does? Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I'll, I'll bring it maybe tomorrow. 
tomorrow we're going Jim. to the Rockwell Museum. But you want to respond directly to the James. Yes. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, James just reminded me of a story about Ernie Gann, who was at one time the highest paid author in America. He wrote The High and the Mighty, a bunch of flying stories, also the antagonists about Masada, and uh, uh, a bunch of other things. Anyway, he would uh, handcuff himself, his ankle, to the, uh, the, the his writing desk, and he'd take the key and throw it at the door. And he knew that his wife would come back from her job at, at 5.30, and she'd come back and, 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 let, uh, him <laughs> and let him off. That's and pretty incredible. I hope, hope he didn't I have got, to uh, I got another story use the facilities, you know? About, a, <laughs> about another writer, I don't remember his name, but he, he was the main writer who wrote under the pseudonym Kenneth Robinson. Paul's going to tell a story that I told, but because of his... Recording difficulties, okay. But anyway, here's the story. <laughs> Kenneth Robeson wrote all the Doc, Doc Savage novels. There are a great number of them. And he uh, typed on a manual typewriter, and he could type so fast and put out so much work that he would occasionally bloody his typewriter. His fingertips would become blisters, the blisters would burst and uh, make the keys sticky. The other thing that Tom mentioned about Kenneth Robinson, or Robinson, was that uh, he moved into an unfinished house while it was still being built, and wrote three or four novels while these guys were hammering and sawing and so on, showing that if you really concentrate, yeah, wood passing by him, things you can uh, you can ignore all these distractions that distract less apt people like myself. So why didn't you just and ignore me? Then, <laughs> Paul, you're supposed to just keep on talking. <laughs> That's right, that would be funny. Uh, but, but, oh, we missed but, the Sid Mead comment. Oh, wait a minute, oh, that's on the other tape. <laughs> we're going to continue this when we run out of tape, since we're nearing the end, on what the about second music? tape that Tom started himself. What about music? Is, is music helpful to you, working with music? Is that the right kind of distraction for you? Books on tape, what? I am kind of an addict for the spoken word. I, mm -hmm. I don't know if it helps or hinders or anything. Yeah. And me neither. It makes it more comfortable. Me neither. Um, and I think environment is something we should address, because you have a very good environment to work in. Um, where you're situated, it's very hard to get to all your books and, and so on. Hard to get right, the distractions. Well, it's kind of hard to get around all those easels and things. Yeah, here I'm cool. on a roller, and I can I can go to over here and and roll around very easily. Well, but you're you're quite mm -hmm. hemmed in. When you're, like, when you're down painting, you have to paint. Well, well I don't want to. Word in I don't want to feel like I'm I'm chained to my easel. I mean, if I feel like that, then then like the Mark Twain quote. I'm not going to want to work because then I'm being paid for it. And I certainly know there's a friend of mine, John Perra, who really can't work when he's paid for it. He hates it. He hates work for it. Um, but on his own, he's, he's great. Um, well, you should just do more stuff for Jim Frankel. Yeah, he doesn't. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get paid for that. Uh, he said he's going to try uh, soon. Um, oh, uh, one thing I mentioned to Paul is quite often I try to ask myself the question when I'm um, I'm watching TV or uh, I'm reading over an article or something or I'm just sitting down doing nothing really which I, which I do I think a lot more than other people just sit and stare at the wall um, and I ask myself would I, would I rather be doing this or would I rather be painting and most of the time the answer is I'd rather be painting. Um, a lot of times I'm at a party and that'll that'll also you know, I'll say, but would I rather be at this party or rather be at this painting? So I've missed a lot of parties because of that. Um, tell me tell me discuss you guys have not discussed why you procrastinate. I think that's the I didn't say I did. Um, 
You did procrastinate. You do procrastinate. Yes, you did because you said you read when you procrastinate. Oh no, I've gotten involved in reading mm. so much that it's hard to stop. I see. Oh. I'll tell you what I do, if you're going to say procrastinate, and as far as getting into a painting, um, usually usually I can, most of the time I can start from the beginning to, to end and, and maintain a reasonable amount of enthusiasm. It's only towards the end of the painting sometimes that, that I begin to lose the enthusiasm to get it done, uh, to, get, to stay with it. Um, the beginning I'm usually because of the underpainting method for me is just so much fun um, that I can really enjoy just dealing with the paint. Um, and then later I, you know, I'm dealing with the forms and everything. And that's just, just as exciting. Um, but the, Would you the suppose thing, that's because of your thing, finger painting technique? Well, um, I've been using my feet lately because my fingers have been drying out. Mm -hmm. And uh, also I've been um, using an exhaust fan and I've just been throwing the wet paint directly into it and uh, then stomping on it with my feet. It's yeah. a pretty good approach. Yeah. The, the biggest problem I have is doing rust because um, I get the best, the best ideas come to me when I'm very relaxed and my mind is just free associating. But unfortunately, that state of mind is so close to sleep that it can create problems for me. Um, so uh, that's a difficult. I mean, when I when I have to do the roughs, that's the hardest thing sometimes for me to do. When roughs come easy, that's that's when it when they're fun. Um, also, if you do a lot of covers by the same authors. You certainly don't want to repeat yourself, and that can drive it fault. Are we recording now, Paul? Or is the tape broken? Don't look at the look at it that way. Well, we've got tons of we've got tons of tape. And you thought it was going to burn? Yeah, I thought that was nearing the end. Paul, why do you procrastinate? Mm -hmm. Quit procrastinating, Paul. Answer the question. Well, I suppose the emotion is anxiety or fear in its less extreme form of of what? Failing. Of not doing good work. Yeah, failing and and paradoxically of not finishing. <laughs> Which is kind of silly. I can see that. Yeah. I'm not finishing in time. Yeah. I can see that. <clears throat> um, now there's a lot of other things I could say here, but it's on my other tape. So why don't we leave space for other people to respond here? Well, I've got some other things to mention. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Get out. Um. Deadlines really are the great motivator, and I've noticed that uh, I've had trouble lately because I'm ahead on concrete, and the reason is that uh, last summer I knew I had to get three issues done for this presentation, and in fact I originally planned to get four done, um, but I, I it soon came clear that that was just impossible for the San Diego Con which was my self-appointed deadline and when I wanted to circulate the the um, presentation. And I was enormously productive in Woodbury uh, because I had a schedule... You said that already, didn't you? You didn't record. ...where I knew what I had to accomplish each day for the next three or four months. I knew I had to be on this page and inking and this page and penciling another issue and on this page of writing and another issue and uh, it gave me incredible focus so much so that I let other affairs in my life slip and um, alienated some relatives and me too have you? no not at all no. 
some aren't alienated for some reason. But uh, I got those three issues done just that summer, and since then I've only gotten one done. Now, true, I've gotten some eight pagers done, and uh, life has been full with a new house and uh, searching for that new house and and uh, you know going on a blind uh, considering a couple of other houses and, and not getting them and and moving and two weeks in LA two, two weeks, weeks in, in LA two weeks in Hawaii you break the work habit that's what happens to me Kincaid seems to deal with travel very well though I don't. He and travels that is a one lot. Of my problems. I, that's why I hate going to conventions, as I come back burned out. Um, <clears throat> tension can, some re, uh, long periods of tension can send you into periods of depression. And I, like I, I did really wish for something to take. But that can slow you down work wise, too. Mm -hmm. Like buying a house can seem to me pretty ten, tension producing. Oh, sure, I'll, I'll continue talking. Um, <clears throat> but Paul's leaving the room. And um, one of the things I've always wanted, one of the things I, bring it here. One of the things I've always uh, wondered about Paul um, is where did he get that Prince, Prince Valiant uh, haircut? Okay, you need to go pick her up? Otherwise, she can't get home. All right, a couple of points about work. Uh, in high school, I read Beyond Freedom and Dignity by B.F. Skinner, and it tremendously impressed me on especially one point, which has stuck with me and I've seen uh, referred to, although not credited to him, in such less exalted sources as the Reader's Digest. And that is, there's no evidence to show that feelings uh, lead to behavior that there is just as much evidence to think that behavior leads to feelings, that uh, that cause and effect business um, starts in the environment and then goes to the world beneath the skin. Which I'd like to inject the point here. That would idea would help support Karl Marx's theory of communism. I just want to make sure everybody knows that. Well, this comes from Tom Kidd, who's uh, known to use many of the same vowels as Adolf Hitler. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, and, and to take more from the Digest article than Skinner, if you act cheerfully, you will eventually feel cheerfully. And, and if you act uh, um, courageously, you will eventually feel courageous. And... Um, Basically, that feelings follow your behavior. So, applying that to the artwork, um, if you're dreading work, if uh, it seems overwhelming and so on, nevertheless, just starting, you know, starting in that upper left-hand corner and doing it will eventually lead to the feelings that make you uh, prone to be productive and happy and cheerful. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. And another one is that if you are feeling over overwhelmed by some problem you're facing in your work, I found it a successful strategy to remind myself that, well, that's not the only thing on this piece that has to be done. There are other things I can attend to. And uh, to attack them and get ahead in those areas, because it's all got to be done before the deadline anyway. And uh, in the time that is spent doing that, uh, I become encouraged and and uh, feel more up to the task of that big insoluble problem so you wanted to say something um, yeah it, it, it might have been Groucho Marx's theory of communism <laughs> <laughs> sure. uh, you had a problem with Skinner because he didn't recognize drives no I think that I, I'm convinced that there are basic um, instances instinct emotions that um, all living creatures are born with and when they're not born with them they're handicapped much like somebody who's born not able to feel pain is a handicap 
mm-hmm. for some people. And but wouldn't you, you say our have, only evidence of that is interactions with the environment? Well, they're actually... That the, if the sucking instinct in a baby only shows itself when it's presented with a nipple. But here's something interesting in terms of instincts. Okay, human babies, kittens, um, both respond the exact same way when they're presented with a fake vanishing point headed towards the ground. They're afraid to walk beyond it because their newborn babies have never experienced falling or anything will not go over the edge even though they won't fall. It's just an illusion. Same with cats. Okay, but here's something interesting. It's a very strange little phenomena. Indian babies will go right over it. They're actually born... East, East Indian or...? American Indian. They're actually born without the instinct to uh, a fear of heights. So it's an actually inborn thing. And I think that other That's emotions... That's certainly a like strong that. argument for yeah. genetic... But... But the thing is, is that... Basis for behavior. Know, but, um, you know, I think that... What well, you're saying sure. Is, I, is I, I don't have a purist view that all behavior is shaped by the environment. Yeah. I mean, well, if it was, there is something to sociobiology. It, yeah, well, if it was... I, I was actually serious when I was talking about Karl Marx, because his theory is that, that men... The only reason men are evil, the only reason they commit acts of evil and greed and so forth, is because... Of their environment, and if you create the perfect communist environment, where you're working for the whole, working for the group, then everybody will work together. And not that I have anything against communism per se, but it doesn't seem to work. All the experiments in socialism no, it's don't seem to dreadful. work. Dreadful. And the communist and socialists would say that that's because of their inability to weed out the evil in society, but I think it's because people just, they, they want well, to Well, you're confusing one thing, and that is that... Um, no, I'm not. We're going off on Marx, a tangent quite Marx frankly. posited a system that would make men behave well, Yeah. but he didn't necessarily design one that was up to the task. Yeah. And certainly the people who have implemented it haven't designed ones that were up to the task. So maybe his premise is still correct, that you could shape an environment that would make men act nobly. Naturally. But, uh, well, what's natural? Well, in other words, without laws... Without coercion. Without coercion, okay. Okay. I couldn't disagree more. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think it's an... Imp- Entirely impractical. We can have this task. another time. I guess it doesn't have to do with artwork, does it? Just, the, just a couple of thoughts that that um, I think that other people that have occurred to other people, and I know, I know, Jim thought of it before. But as long as you make, for me, as long as I make the work my own work and something I'm doing for myself, I can remain excited about it. If it becomes a job for somebody else, I'm not not going to have the same level of energy and excitement going through the whole thing, um, which uh, supports uh, Mark Twain's theory. So, um, one of the things <clears throat> I always try to do is try not to think of my work as a job. I try to look at it as something I'm doing that has something beyond a job. I can sit back and look at the paintings I've done and feel like I've I've done something. And as long as I know that this painting is going to add to that volume of work, um, I don't feel um, that there's any reservation in doing it. And just go right into it. So that's it. I, don't I think that applies especially when uh, you're getting an un- unusual fee for the job. I think too little money, and it's easy to fall into. I just want to get it done. Yeah, I just want to get it done because they're not paying me anything for this, and I'm really losing money on this job. And a whole lot of money makes you rather nervous that, gee, 
Okay. I've never been paid this much. It's got to be the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. Baron Story talked about David Palladini, his friend, who would... He said, this is an artist who should never be allowed to talk to his clients because every job he got, he would start talking it up to the client and say, this is going to be the best thing I've ever done. It's going to be the total fundamental expression of my style. It'll really be, it'll really knock you out. And it's like, you know, of course he couldn't live up to that. Oh, and <clears throat> that reminds me, Baron Story once laid out the emotional stages of a commercial art job. Oh yeah, okay, that's interesting. And I think I think they're at least useful to mention here. And one is you get the assignment. You're flattered and excited and think, gee, this has a lot of potential. And then you uh, work on your ideas for it. And you come up with an idea that really excites you. This is going to be a masterpiece. This is going to be great. And you start working on it and painting on it and you realize that you only have a certain number of skills and a certain amount of time and it's not going to be that great and, and despair sets in and then you act like an adult and make your peace with time and, uh, and uh, skill limitations and you get it in but I thought that was a good yeah, I think that's, that's, profile of the states that's a, of mind that's a fair statement I think uh, not like that all the time but Pretty close to that. I guess there's some times when, you know, it's just another piece. This yeah. isn't a very good idea, but it's time to work. Well, that's that's the biggest thing. Is I really do try to make sure my ideas are. I'm excited about my, about my ideas. I try not to turn into rough that I'm not excited about. Mm -hmm. Sometimes my excitement wanes after the rough is chosen, but. Paperbacks are an extremely privileged field in that sense. I mean, there's no other area in commercial art where you're given this much freedom. Unless, you know... Except comics. You're Bob Peek. Comics? Comics? Yeah, yeah I'd say you're, you're right. Freedom. Well, but you're doing your own. Yeah. When you're, you're doing your own, yeah. That's what, I, that's what I meant. And I don't think that there are a lot of people out there who do do their own. That's true. It's mostly work for hire and... Oh. You shuffle your pages up to somebody else to finish. I keep forgetting the bastardized. Oh no, this all fit here. So you're you're given right scripts here. you don't like and you're Chris Warner. Well this pretty much concludes this tape on work. And uh, what I'm going to do is enclose an additional tape so that people can respond um, to other comments and include some of their own ideas. Um, today it's April 23rd, 1987, and I'm going to, I guess, give this tape back to Paul tomorrow because we're going to the uh, Rockwell Museum, and he'll forward it to whoever should get it next, along with the additional tape for them to record on to. Um, you're going to get a, back a lot more than you expected, perhaps. Well, in a sense, this song was one philosophical side to the question. Is that what we're doing? We're taking what they're given because we're working for a living? Um, someone else can answer that question.